morning. I'm Kristen. I'm here to draw your blood today. Good morning. Could you please state your name and date of birth? Pat White, November 11th, 1986. Thank you. Have you had anything to eat or drink in the last 12 hours? Not since 9 last night. Thanks. Do you have any questions? No. All right. It will just take me a minute to get everything set. Blood collection by venipuncture is one of the most common procedures performed in a healthcare setting. Common but also complex, requiring knowledge and skill to assure the accuracy and integrity of the samples drawn and to eliminate risk to both patient and healthcare workers. The first step is to accurately ID the patient using at least two forms of identification. Does the name and date of birth on the requisition form match what the patient is telling you? Does it match what is on the patient ID wristband? Has the patient followed special orders, such as fasting prior to blood draw? Address the inconsistency first with a requesting physician or healthcare worker on duty. But if the given information does agree, it's time to prepare yourself and the patient for a successful blood draw using proper standard precautions. The phlebotomist washes and then dons a clean pair of gloves before proceeding. Make sure alcohol prep pads, gauze, tape, the correct gauge needles, and required evacuated collection tubes are within easy reach for you, but out of the reach of the patient. Then speak reassuringly to the patient as you position him for the draw. I'm all set here. If you'd please straighten your arm. It'll just take a moment while I apply the tourniquet. Applying a tourniquet slows the flow of blood in the veins and increases venous filling, thus making the veins more prominent, easier to locate, and easier to enter. However, leaving the tourniquet on for longer than one minute may affect laboratory test results and should therefore be removed and reapplied if the procedure will take longer than one minute. Use your fingertip to palpate the antecubital fossa to locate the median cubital vein. Palpation helps determine the direction of blood flow in the vein, to gauge the vein's size and depth, and to estimate its tendency to roll. It also helps differentiate veins from arteries. Unlike veins, arteries have thicker feeling walls and are more elastic to the touch. Use an alcohol prep pad to cleanse the skin around the site. In a fluid, circular motion, swab from the center to the periphery of the site, being careful not to drag the pad back across the cleanse field. Let the area air dry. This prevents contamination of either the patient or the specimen. Grasp the patient's arm firmly with your hand, placing your thumb approximately two inches below the intended puncture site. With your thumb, pull the skin taut over the vein to help anchor it in place. Then let the patient know you're ready to make the puncture so the patient won't startle and jump. You'll feel a slight pinch. Position the needle bevel side up and line it up with a vein. Position the needle so that it forms a 30 degree angle with the surface of the arm. With a single, short, but firm motion, swiftly insert the needle through the skin and into the vein. Push the evacuated tube onto the needle when the needle enters the vein. As the vein aligns with the needle, blood will begin to move out of the vein up into the needle. Maintain a constant, slight forward pressure on the end of the tube. The evacuated tubes are color-coded based on their additives. Know the types of additives and which color tubes are to be drawn based on requisition. As soon as blood begins to flow into the collection tube, instruct the patient to open his hand and remove the tourniquet from his arm. Removing the tourniquet allows the blood to return to its normal rate of flow through the vein and helps reduce bleeding at the puncture site. A gentle mixing by inversion at least eight times is required to ensure that any additives in the tube are incorporated into the blood sample. We're almost finished here. Are you doing okay? Fine. Engage the safety device on the needle and use the sharps device for proper disposal. Applying pressure at the needle entry site immediately after removing the needle will prevent a hematoma from forming and allow hemostasis to seal the wound. Please keep pressure on the gauze pad for several minutes to ensure that the blood flow stops. In this illustration, you can see formation of the platelet plug and the fibrin clot. Applying pressure at the needle entry site immediately after removing the needle will prevent a hematoma from forming and allow hemostasis to seal the wound. 
In this illustration, you can see formation of the platelet plug and fibrin clot. Apply the ID label on the filled evacuation tube and store it for transport to the lab. The label must include at least the patient's ID number, full name, date of birth, and today's date. Using standard precautions, dispose of needles in a sharps container. Dispense of all other used non-sharp materials, including used gloves and gauze pads, in an approved trash receptacle. And disinfect all contaminated surface areas. You've just completed a successful blood draw, providing a sample that can be processed for analysis. Fortunately, most blood draws are completed in an entirely professional, skilled, and successful manner. Most, but not all. Poor technique, poor judgment, lack of knowledge, loss of concentration, and undue haste, all are factors that can negatively impact the integrity of a sample. Or worse, that can create undue stress and pain for the patient or cause a patient physical harm. Let's take a look. Failure to align the needle perfectly with the vein and failure to insert the needle at a 30 degree angle can result in the needle missing its mark. Poor technique that will require an unwelcome second needle stick. Inserting the needle at too steep or too shallow an angle and not lining up precisely with the vein are two common reasons for missing the vein. To the patient, that usually means only one thing, further anxiety and discomfort. But it can have other consequences as well. Serious complications are most likely to arise when targeting the basilic vein, with its close proximity to nerves, which can be permanently damaged, or the brachial artery, which could be nicked. Even with a proper angle, the appropriate needle size must be used. Freddie, you're only gonna feel a very small pinch this time. Uh-huh. It is acceptable to use a smaller needle called a butterfly. However, it should be noted that butterflies are a larger gauge needle, 23 to 25 gauge, and therefore have a smaller bore size. A large gauge straight needle, 25 gauge in this case, may make piercing the vein more certain, but as you can see, the smaller bore size can cause the red blood cells to lice. While it appeared to the healthcare professional that this blood draw was successful, it's clear once the sample is centrifuged that the choice of needle gauge was a poor one. The selection compromised the integrity of the sample. Aside from these two examples of invisible errors, there are many visible signs that a healthcare professional may not be following standard precautions that ensure a quality blood draw as well as a satisfactory customer experience. All right, you're good to go. That's it? Yeah, I just need to put some tape on it. Ah, Band-Aid, that'll work. What about this? Oh, you're good to go. Good to go? Not necessarily. Failure to apply pressure on the puncture site immediately following removal of the needle can cause bleeding from the vein into the space around it, forming a hematoma, a collection of blood under the skin surface that will become bruised in appearance and painful to the touch. There are many times, of course, when a single blood draw involves more than the collection of a single sample. You may be required to collect as many as 10 tubes in a single draw, and this requires even greater skill and careful planning to complete successfully. Two keys to a successful multiple tube draw must occur in the planning stage. You need to determine which gauge needle will be appropriate for all tests being requested. And you need to plan the order of the draw to assure the integrity of all samples. But your technique should remain the same. Let's take a few moments to review.
Position the needle bevel side up and line it up with a vein. Position the needle to form a 30 degree angle with the surface of the arm. With a single short but firm motion, swiftly insert the needle through the skin and into the vein. Push the evacuated tube onto the needle when the needle enters the vein. As the vein aligns with the needle, blood will begin to move out of the vein up into the needle. Maintain a constant, slight forward pressure on the end of the tube to prevent release of the shutoff valve. As soon as blood begins to flow into the collection tube, instruct the patient to open his hand and remove the tourniquet from his arm. Removing the tourniquet allows the blood to return to its normal rate of flow through the vein and helps reduce bleeding at the puncture site. When performing a multi-tube draw, it is important to follow the correct hospital-mandated order of draw. Blood cultures are always drawn first. However, in a routine vena puncture, a light blue tube should be drawn first, followed by a red top, gold, green, lavender, and gray. We're almost done here. This is the last tube I need to draw. When will I know the results? I'm kind of anxious about them. Your samples will go over to the lab today and your doctor will notify you after the results are in. You don't see them? No, I don't. The samples that we draw today are tested by laboratory professionals who relay those results directly to the physician. My responsibility is to assure the quality of the samples I draw so that the results your doctor receives are both accurate and meaningful. The level of quality and integrity of the samples the laboratory receives is dependent upon the level of skill, knowledge, and professionalism of the phlebotomist. A big responsibility, but one that can make a real difference in the lives of your patients.